since the dawn of civilization. The powerful have conspired to twist the course of history to suit their own designs. Like puppeteers, a few shadowy figures could still be pulling the strings of destiny for billions. Those who cry conspiracy are usually mocked at, but sometimes the truth is so obvious it goes unnoticed. Are those merely paranoid fantasies cooked up to feed the appetite of paperback readers and web surfers, but which bear no relation to reality? Or are we living out some perfectly executed plan? Wars, revolutions, social movements, terrorist attacks. Everything is given an official explanation. But perhaps nothing is what it seems to be. Let's dare to unveil the incredible world of secret societies. Freemasonry, mother of all secret societies, perhaps the most suspected and persecuted organization of all time. And this in spite of the fact that there are few, very few people who truly know what it's all about. Is it really, as its critics say, the hidden power behind the most important world events? Or is it, as we can see today, a slightly decadent social club with childish rituals? How did this antique secret society that still boasts more than six million brethren get started? What are its real objectives? How has it influenced world events for more than 12 centuries? And more important still, how is it influencing them today? Freemasonry defines itself as an innocent fraternity whose primary objectives is to seek the welfare of humanity through the spiritual elevation of its members. But for its critics, it's just a gigantic pyramid of manipulators with the secret objective of world domination, with unwritten codes of silence and cooperation reminiscent of the Mafia. So who's right? A swift perusal of the history of Freemasonry brings to light certain disquieting characteristics. Its impenetrable secrecy, the severity of the penalties for those who break their oaths, the general public's ignorance of its true reach, influence, and real purposes. And most disturbing of all, its obvious participation in many of the key events that have changed the course of history over the last few centuries. Secret rituals, obscure symbolism, mysterious objectives, qualities made an easy target, mainly by its arch enemy, the Roman Catholic Church. And one wonders, are these real reasons to fear Freemasonry? Or is it all just a matter of groundless accusations, mere incomprehension and prejudice against enlightenment? Why do the Freemasons still maintain such secrecy if they have nothing to hide? So how did it all begin? The origins of Freemasonry go back to the 7th century, when it was founded as a guild of builders, bricklayers and stonemasons, who tried to keep secret their technical knowledge in order to protect their livelihoods. These masons were not the construction workers we might picture today, but technical and artistic masters that could undertake the most prestigious constructions at a time when building technology was limited to a set square, a plumb line, and little else. The original masons built cathedrals and castles that endured for centuries, surviving wars, earthquakes, time. To the common people of those times, such technical accomplishments endowed the masons with almost magical powers, powers that had to be kept secret to outsiders. Thin columns that still hold graceful, or give arches with narrow ribs. Towers of hitherto unimaginable heights that scrape the heavens and inspire God-fearing veneration. Chambers with perfect acoustics and overhanging gargoyles to scare away evil spirits. Ratios of strength, beauty, and proportion that even today surprise engineers and mathematicians. The extraordinary knowledge and skills of these men constituted the best kept secret of all time. 
The development of projects would take generations to complete, and the accompanying know-how was passed down from father to son, from teacher to apprentice. The full preparation of an apprentice took seven years and began when he was only 12. After the first three years, there was an initiation ritual and certain codes and symbols were revealed to him. Upon completing the seventh year, he would graduate as a fellow of the craft. Only years later would he qualify as a master mason. Freemasonry soon acquired a spiritual and ideological dimension that clashed with the value system of its time. This made it the perfect organization to host ideas considered dangerous, ideas that needed to be kept secret at all costs. This earliest manifestation of masonry is known as operative masonry, since its members were active builders. Though the society was born in the Middle Ages, Masons were inspired by much older secret societies, some dating from pre-Christian times. Secret societies have existed since the dawn of civilization. They were formed in order to preserve and defend knowledge that afforded power, and to transmit and maintain ideas that offended the powers that be. Ideas whose free and open expression might have brought down a death sentence upon a person who simply dared to utter them. A good example was the Pythagoreans, who were organized like a secret society. Pythagoras was a philosopher who lived in Greece in the sixth century BC, and his discoveries had immense influence on Masonic thought. Centuries later, Pythagoras's theorem was of great importance to the operative Masons, as it allowed them, for example, to execute perfectly straight angles. Pythagoras was pursued and murdered by his enemies, but his knowledge persisted, and the set square became the emblematic symbol of Freemasonry that is still used to this day. Operative Masons clearly despised what the clergy had become just a few centuries after the death of Christ, a decadent bunch of sinners too busy looking after their worldly possessions to take time to shepherd the souls of their flock. The same feelings were felt for the oppressing nobility who owned land and life. The irony was that the Masons, ideological antagonist to the persecutory dogmatism of Rome, had in the Catholic Church and in nobility their main client. The old bas-reliefs and ornamentations of Europe's most famous cathedrals still bear witness to the sharp humor through which the Masons left evidence of their disagreement with and distrust of that omnipresent power. In the church of St. Sibald in Nuremberg, there is a tomb showing a monk and a nun in a pretty compromising position. In the cathedral of Würzburg, replicas are found of the famous Joachim and Boaz columns that stood at the entrance of King Solomon's temple. They are fundamental symbols of masonry, together with Hiram Abbott, the mythological builder of King Solomon's temple, who was murdered because of his refusal to reveal the secret of his art, a genuine coded Masonic signature. But the belief that Freemasonry is an atheistic movement solely because of its hatred of the Catholic Church is completely misguided. The Masons simply wanted to have the liberty to worship God in the way they chose, not in the way dictated to them by Rome. To be accepted into the Brotherhood, every Mason must believe in a unique supreme being, no matter who it is. To accommodate for different beliefs and in line with their origins as builders, Masons have come to call this being Gao, or Gautu, great architect of the universe. Its symbol, the all-seeing eye, is inspired by the Egyptian eye of Horus. The Regius manuscript on display at the British Museum is an anonymous poem on the subject of moral duties and is dated around 1390. It is the oldest known Masonic document written in poetry and lists 15 commandments, among which can be read, 
to be honest and speak true, not to steal or protect thieves or murderers, to be wise and strong and to be able to do all jobs, not to speak evil of the work of other masters, to teach the apprentices that their art is always worthy, to conceal neither falsehoods nor others in sin. The feudal age came to a close and the Catholic Church stopped being the Mason's major client. It was then that this original guild of spiritually free bricklayers turned into a powerful and influential secret society, open to all men who wanted to accept its rules and would take an oath to keep its secrets. It was called Freemasonry, or Free and Accepted Masons. Soon it would be the key protagonist in some of the most important events in history. Let's recap. Far from being an ignorant association of superstitious bricklayers, the original operative Masons were upholders of ideals of liberty that naturally brought them into conflict with those who were both their best clients and their oppressors, the Catholic Church and the European monarchies. Over time, they evolved into a powerful secret society that attracted some of the most influential figures in history and came to be known as the Freemasonry, or Free and Accepted Masons, a secret society that still operates today. The name Free and Accepted Masons was born when the original operative masonry transformed itself into a wider secret society in a period that lasted from the end of the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Free makes reference to the fact that no slave or bondsman could join, and accepted implies that the member is accepted despite not being a builder. Though the structure and ceremonial rites of the original Masons has remained shrouded in secrecy, it is known that they were based on the Egyptian liturgy of sacerdotal initiation, the death and resurrection of Osiris, the renunciation of the indifference to a previous life. Above all, Freemasonry expects its brethren to die spiritually and be reborn as new superior men. Even today, these original rituals are repeated in an almost identical fashion. First, the profane is led to the Chamber of Reflection, a room painted black with a table, a stool and a desk. Upon the table there is a jug of water, some bread and two cups, one filled with sulphur, the other with salt. On the walls are the symbols, the sickle, the sand clock, the rooster and the letters V, I, T, R, I, O, L, which is an acronym for the Latin alchemical phrase, Visita Interiore, Terrae Rectificando in Vienes Occultum Lapide. Visit the interior parts of the earth. By rectification, thou shalt find the hidden stone an invitation to an inner search of the depths of the human soul in silence and meditation. The profane answers the questions. What does man owe to God? What does man owe to himself? What does man owe to others? And he draws his last will. Blindfolded. The candidate is divested of all metallic substances, since metal represents civilization, and stands neither naked nor clothed, and similarly with his right leg uncovered as a sign of humility. His left shoe is removed, also a sign of humility, and a cable toe is placed round his neck a symbol of what binds him to the profane world. 